good. And all the time. But it's good. You know, it sounds like it. But it's good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let me see your hands up if God has been good to you. Amen. I would say, blessed are those who come at 7 a.m. on a holiday to pray. Because there is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. I pray to God for this privilege to be his messenger this morning. I was not expecting it to be a surprise. And I'm grateful to God for this privilege. I like to appreciate the work of the SA and the SA Religious uh, Religious Life Committee for all the work that they've done. I ask that God will bless you a lot. Before I share the message this morning, I'd like to ask that you would pray in your heart with me and for me. And I would say what God wants me to say to you this morning. At the end of the prayer, we will sing, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn the chorus of that song. I will pray and I will share the word that the Lord has laid on my heart this morning. Please bow your head with me and say a prayer in your heart for the Lord to speak to you what He wants. Minds 
of the people then. So it means that the people, the Jewish people, had the kingdom of God as something very prominent in their mind. But what did they think about the kingdom of God? For the Jewish people, basically, the kingdom of God was political. It was patterned after the kingdoms of this world. They believe that the kingdom of God was like the great empire of Rome, the Roman captors, uh, the Roman, the world empire of Rome. As a result, they looked forward to a political messiah, someone who was going to set them free from the shackles of the oppression of Roman tyranny and usher them into the kingdom of God. One of the groups of the Jewish people were the zealots. They were very zealous for the kingdom of God. So zealous that they violently murdered and assassinated Roman soldiers whenever they had the opportunity. They caused riots and insurrections so that they could usher in the kingdom of God. They were willing to fight even to die for the kingdom of God. As a result, many of these zealots, many of these Jews were crucified by the Roman power. Barabbas, the man who was supposed to die in place of Jesus, as an example of a zealot-like Jew. Luke 23, 18 and 19 tells us that Barabbas was arrested because he caused rebellion and because he committed murder. It's interesting to see that when Jesus came into the scene, what people thought of the kingdom of God, this presupposition of the kingdom of God, this preconceived idea that the kingdom of God was political, affected the way people saw everything that Jesus did. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, David Asherick was sharing uh, conducted a week of prayer for, at the GC earlier this year in March. The theme of that was the kingdom of God in my life today. That was the theme of the week of prayer. It was just four days. I was privileged to listen to one of the sermons and I got some of the things I share with you this morning from some of his insights. He says, when Jesus fed the 5,000, the people saw, the people, when the people saw that, they said, oh, when our armies attack the Romans and our food supply runs out, Jesus will multiply our food supply. When Jesus healed the sick, the people thought, well, when our Romans, uh, when our soldiers are down, are wounded, are sick, are ailing, Jesus will heal their wounds. And I think the best of all was when they saw Jesus raise the dead. When they saw Jesus raise Lazarus four days after, they said, oh, when our soldiers are killed, Jesus will call them back to life. We will never lose manpower in battle. Everything Jesus did, they saw in the light of this political kingdom. This was the way the Jewish people thought about the kingdom of God. From a political perspective, the kingdom of their own faith. Even the disciples of Jesus were not left out in this thought of the kingdom. They always fought and quarreled with each other over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They thought, well, when Jesus took power, I would be the prime minister and I would be the minister of defense or foreign affairs. They were always quarreling and it was so serious. And the mother of James and John came to Jesus and said, Lord, when you sit on power, can you put my sons one on your right and one on your left. Matthew 20 gives us that account. And the other disciples were angry at these boys, that's their mother, to talk to Jesus for them. The disciples thought the same. When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, Peter had a sword and he was ready to fight for this kingdom. He was ready to fight for Jesus. He was ready to cut off the head of the high priest's servant, Malchus, but he missed. He got the ears open. When Jesus was crucified and died, and he walked after his resurrection with some of his disciples on the way to Emmaus, Luke 24, 21 
shows their thoughts. It says, we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And in Acts 1 verse 6, even after the resurrection, they said to Jesus, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? And so that was the way the people thought about the kingdom of God, even the disciples of Jesus. But when Jesus spoke about the kingdom, he revealed a completely different kind of kingdom. A kingdom with a different nature. When Jesus told parables, he began with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. If you ask the Jewish people to fill in the blanks, the kingdom of heaven is like what? They probably would choose something that was uh, uh, that had the image of violence. Maybe the kingdom of God was like bulls charging and stampeding around or trying to take over a cattle ranch. The kingdom of God was like a hunting pride of lions or a wolf pack or maybe angry birds. Something violent. But when Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he said the kingdom of God is like a sword going forth to sow was like a net full of fish, ten virgins, a man going on a long journey. These were not images that motivated or inspired anyone to fight for a political kingdom. So if the kingdom of God was not political, what kind of kingdom was it? When Jesus spoke and gave the sermon on the mount, he introduced a radically different kingdom. When he stood on the Mount Sinai of the New Testament to declare the principles of this kingdom, Donald Craybill calls it an upside-down kingdom. There was a kingdom where the citizens were poor, the mourning, the hungry, the persecuted, and the hated. But really, the Jewish people would have said, well, the kingdom of God is for those who are blessed, who are rich, who are wealthy, but who are wealthy and well-to-do, just like the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus presents a kingdom that is opposite that of this world's ideals and standards. It was not a kingdom of brute violence for political power. It was not a kingdom for yearning for worldly wealth. It was a kingdom of blessed virtue. It was not a kingdom of righteousness. It was a kingdom of righteousness. It was a kingdom where the citizens did not fight their enemies, but learned to love them. Paul succinctly summarizes it in Romans 14, 17. He says, the kingdom of God is not about me of eating or drinking. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. This kingdom begins with the rule of God in the hearts of men. Are you with me? And so today, as we look at our lives, there is a tendency that we have the same challenge as the Jewish people did. The Jewish people saw the kingdom of God as the political, worldly kingdom. And today, as Christians, I would say that we are citizens of two kingdoms, of this one and of the kingdom of God. And we want to get the best of both worlds. But many times, my dear friends, we seek this world and its kingdom. Jesus speaks of this as he introduces the upside down kingdom in Matthew chapter 6. We'll be going through our Bibles very soon. I'd not like to speak without the Bibles. I hope you have your Bible here. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, Do not lay up treasures for yourself on earth. Lay them up in heaven because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is the kingdom of God in your heart? Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Is the God of the heavenly kingdom your master, your Lord, 
and your king. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Don't worry about the things of this earth. Your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these needs will be added to you. Is the kingdom of God your priority? And that's what I like to talk about this morning. Luke presents the same account in Luke chapter 12. But he presents it in a different context. While Matthew presents it in a context of daily needs, Luke presents it in a context of material wealth. In Luke 12, from verse 13 to 21, Jesus tells a parable of the rich fool. And then in the next verses, from 22 to 34, he presents this part of the Sermon on the Mount. The context is being anxious for money or for worldly treasure. Today we live in a world where there is craze for more, for possession. We want to have more cars and more houses. We want to have bigger bank accounts. We want to have better high-tech gadgets, more iPods, iPads, iTouch. You know what I'm talking about. We want Wi-Fi, all those updated stuff. We want to get jobs with more pay and better allowances. And how can I forget? We want to get more degrees. And you know, with the degree comes a better paycheck. Is that right? Or you might say, what's wrong with getting a degree? What's wrong with getting more houses and more cars and all of that? But the Bible says in Luke 12, verse, verse 15, that a man's life is, does not consist in the abundance of possession. In the kingdom of God, it is being rich towards God that matters. Where is the desire for the kingdom of God in all of this? It's very clear, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot have two priorities. It is either one or the other. If we are seeking to make a name for ourselves in this kingdom, then we lose the desire for the kingdom of God. Where is the desire for the kingdom in all of this. In Matthew 6, 32 and 33, Luke says the same in Luke 12, verse 30 and 31. Jesus makes a comparison. In the, the previous verses, Jesus says, the Gentiles, Luke calls them, the people, the nations of the world, they seek after these things, what we will eat, and what we will drink, and what we will wear. But, Jesus says, in an imperative voice, the second person plural, he says, you seek the kingdom of God. It's not a common statement, an imperative is usually a command, it's usually an order, something, an instruction that should be taken seriously. In this imperative voice, Jesus says, Seek the kingdom. The word seek is not a careless word. It is not something that should be taken anyhow. It's not a word that suggests being carefree. The word seek has synonyms like to pursue, to, to search for, to examine, to investigate, to desire to deliberate, to aim for, to strive for, to request, or to demand. This reveals the attitude we should have for the kingdom of God. In these two passages, Matthew 6, 32 and 33, Luke 12, 30 and 31, the same word seek is used for the Gentiles. They seek after these things. And these two verses make a contrast. While the people of the world intentionally seek after these things, the citizens of the kingdom of God should intentionally seek for the kingdom. There should be a difference. But there's a problem when we who call ourselves citizens of the kingdom of God are seeking the same things as the people of the world. Are you with me? Jesus. 
Krishna says that there needs to be a difference. The kingdom of God should be sought intentionally and it should be our priority. Matthew's account adds the word first. That word you will not find in Luke. But Matthew says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? On the scale of preference, the kingdom of God must be on top. Follow me to another parable of Jesus in Matthew 13. The speaker spoke about it last night. The, the pearl of great price. It's a little illustration of what it means to seek for the kingdom. Matthew 13, from verse 44 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid. And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. But 45 and 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking, that's that word again, seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Seeking the kingdom requires investing all that we have. Seeking the kingdom is an all or nothing at all investment. Not some, but all. And so I want to ask you this morning as I try to quote. Looking at your life today, would there be a difference if you intentionally began to seek the kingdom of God? Would there be a difference in your life today if you seek first the kingdom of God? Is there evidence in your life that the kingdom of God is your priority? Is there evidence in your life that the kingdom of God is the burden of your heart? Is your anxiety, is your obsession, if I may say. I was reading a book in preparation for revival and reformation. I, I've been privileged to conduct two weeks of revival this year. But I asked myself, what is this revival thing all about? So I decided to look for books speaking about revival. I found one that I treasure so much in this library. It's like the revival of people saturated with God. Written by Brian Edwards. And I want to quote one of, from one of the pages, verse 42, and I want you to pay attention to it. It says, And when society no longer thinks of eternity, it almost goes without saying that it is because the church no longer thinks that way our lives as Christians, our worship impressed the world with our love for this life. There is little about us to convince the world that we are motivated for eternity rather than for time. People do not touch eternity in our meetings. They rarely hear of it in our conversation. They certainly do not see it as the priority of our life. Are you listening? Of course, it glances off our gospel here and there, but we are not passionate about heaven or the second coming of Christ. We have lost the sense of accountability. Does that sound like you? Does that sound like us today? We love this world and the things of it, but Jesus says to us this morning, see. I was privileged to preach at a church and I asked the question, how many of you would like Jesus to come? And the church raised their hand. It was a very good response. But when I asked the second question, I was a little disappointed. How many of us want Jesus to come next year? I can count the number of hands that went up. Even next year. I was disappointed because Adventists are people who are supposed to be passionate about the second coming of Jesus, right? right? Adventists are supposed to be people who are telling the world, Jesus is coming soon. And I wondered in my heart, 
What is here in this world that we want to stay here any longer for? Is it the natural disasters? Is it the typhoons that are wrecking the places? Is it the hurricane like Irene that is messing up the east coast of the United States? the earthquakes, it is the tsunamis, what is it? What is it on this earth that we still want to stay here for? Is it the crime and the corruption in our governments? Is it the sickness and the ailments that are killing people? Is it the disease, the famine in the horn of Africa? What is it that we still want on this earth? We need to be passionate about the second coming of Jesus. There is nothing in this world to seek, my dear friends, because it will all pass away. Jesus says, seek the kingdom, for very soon the kingdom of grace will give way to the kingdom of glory. Jesus will come very soon. It's not time to assume that you are a citizen of the kingdom. Are you listening to me? It's not time to say, oh, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm sure that I'll be part of the kingdom. It's not time to assume that you are a part of the kingdom because you keep the Sabbath, because you're a remnant of God. Many who are Seventh-day Adventists will not be part of that kingdom. Many who have attended a wonderful Christian institution like this will miss the kingdom. Are you listening to me? We should not assume. It's amazing that at a week of prayer, this place is not packed full. I heard of a church. Peter Wagner writes about the church of uh, Dr. Yonggi Cho in South, uh, South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea, where people wake up at 5 a.m. to pray every day. And when you get to the car park, it's filled with cars. And there's even no parking space. At 5 a.m., People are ready to pray for the kingdom of God. That is commitment. Do we see that today? When you talk about fasting, people are afraid. But when you when you talk about uh, writing an exam, if the exam is at 5 a.m., you'll be there to write that exam because we want to get a good grade. If the United States Embassy asks you to show up at the embassy for a visa at 5 a.m., you'll be there. Is that right? That's what it means to seek. That's what seeking is about. It shows in your action. It's not just something you talk about. It is evident in your life. So are you seeking the kingdom? I ask you this morning. Are you seeking the kingdom of God? Are you not just talking about it or is it showing? Is it evident in your conversation? When you talk, do people see that you are passionate about the kingdom of God? Friends, it's, a, it's possible to be in an Adventist institution and still miss the kingdom of God. <coughs> Above all, Jesus says, who say, Lord, Lord, the left of the kingdom. And not all the virgins are welcome to celebrate at the marriage feast with the bridegroom. It's not time to assume that you are a citizen of the kingdom. It's time to be sure, to ensure that you are a citizen. One day, friends, the kingdom of grace will give way to the kingdom of glory. One day, faith will become sight. One day, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. One day, there will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more typhoons or hurricanes or earthquakes. There will be no more of the disasters in this world. No more crime and corruption. God will create a new heavens and a new earth, a kingdom of glory where righteousness dwells. But that kingdom is not for everyone. It is for those who seek it. Who seek it first. Who seek it with all that they have. For one day when heaven and earth will be shaken. As Hebrews 12, 27 and 28 said, we will receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. 
And so the question this morning is, are you seeking the kingdom? It's time to pray. You're in the week of prayer. It's wonderful. Every week of prayer, I expect something from God. I don't know about you. I don't know the request that you have in your heart for this week of prayer. But I want to say to you this morning, in the words of Jesus himself, don't worry about whatever it is that you're worried about. Seek the kingdom first. All those things. <coughs> your spiritual life should be your priority. When your spiritual life is okay, God will take care of everything else. When you mind God's business, He'll mind yours. So are you seeking the kingdom? I want to pray this morning with, with anyone here who would like to say, Lord, I'm tired of making the kingdom of this world my priority. I am tired of seeking for the things of this earth. I want to seek you first from now on. I want that passion for the kingdom of God. I want to begin to have it right now. If that is your desire, I'd like you to stand where you are as we sing the song, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We recognize in our lives that we have made the things of this world our priority. Father, we stand with requests in our hearts. We're concerned about our finances. We're concerned about our health. We're concerned about exam success. But Lord, this morning we stand in obedience to your imperative to seek you first because you will take care of everything else. And so, Father, as we stand this morning, we want to make a commitment to you. Please help us to begin to seek your kingdom intentionally. Help us not to do it carelessly. Help us from now to begin to give all that we have to seek this kingdom. Father, we pray that we will be diligent to make heaven out of our religion. That we aim for it and make sure that we are part of it. Thank you, Lord, because you will grant the desires of our hearts only according to your will. But above all, Lord, cause us to seek your kingdom first above all else. This is our prayer this morning in Jesus' name.